Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian. It finally happened, people. We don't have to give you any more of those Jack Eichel trade watches anymore because this morning he was traded to the Vegas Golden Knights. Chris, how relieved are you at the fact that uh, this long, arduous trade news that we were all expecting for months has finally come to fruition? Well, I, I got to say, Julian, I'm most relieved for Jack Eichel, to be honest. I mean, I think That's that, fair. you know, often lost in this is that, you know, he's been sitting there unable to get his neck uh, surgery done. You know, I think it's been a bit of discomfort for him. Obviously, it's not even just the physical pain, not the diminish that, but even just the uncertainty, right? Like you're, you don't know what you're working out for. You, you know, you don't know what your life's going to look like. I think a whole bunch of clarity comes with a deal like this. And I mean, if you're Jack Eichel, this could not have worked out any better, right? You know, you're going to an organization that does nothing but try to win and win so far in its history. You know, you're moving to a no tax state in Nevada. So he's already making more on that $10 million annual salary at, you know, a great place to live. And, you know, I, I really do believe it's it's the kind of place, who knows, he could play the rest of his career. I mean, it's 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 hard to say, but, you know, I think that, you know, getting that kind of clarity, landing in such a great spot and then being able now in the next few days here uh, to undergo a, a surgery in something I should mention, Julian, he's going to mm-hmm. get the picket. He's going to get to choose the surgeon, where it happens. You know, as we're recording right now, he's got a couple different options, but, you know, the Golden Knights after, you know, everything he went through in Buffalo are saying, you've done all the work on this. You've met with physicians and specialists and second opinions, third opinions, 10th opinions. You know, you go ahead and plan this. We're in your corner. And so I think that has to be nice too after some of the, the battles he had with Buffalo. I should add for everyone listening and watching, this episode is going to be pretty loaded already off the top. We have a lot to say when it comes to Jack Eichel. Uh, CJ has also been busy over the last few days with his columns in the Toronto Star uh, when it comes to certain players speaking out about the NHLPA in the wake of uh, Kyle Beach and everything that has followed over the last week. Uh, We have the stick tap segment, and uh, we're going to introduce another segment called the grab bag, where uh, CJ, because he has so much on his mind, uh, we got to get to it somehow. So why not? Have a this grab is, bag. It's, it's kind of like insider trading. This is going to exactly. This is going to be the episode. I say the wrong thing or say too much because my brain isn't going in every direction all at once. And so this will be the unfiltered version, even more than normal. <laughs> I love it. I'm going right. to radio myself. Oh, man. Speaking of radio, uh, as the Jack Eichel trade was being announced earlier this morning, I was on TSN 690 and I got asked like, what do you think of this trade? I'm like, uh, okay, this is just what I'm thinking. So I can't imagine what you've been feeling over the last little while trying to report on this and trying to make sure all the facts were right. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff flying around. I mean, this is a different kind of trade. You know, I've been around a league a long time. I haven't covered anything quite like this. I think that the fact that the surgery hung out there, you know, another thing that was probably going to happen, Julian, is there was probably going to be some kind of grievance filed by Jack Eichel and the NHLPA if this went on too much longer, just basically saying that the procedure he wanted to have, this this artificial disc replacement surgery, you know, she should be allowed to have it because he's got, you know, a number of doctors and specialists that have have said it's a fair course of action to, to treat his herniated disc. Um, so you had that, you know, obviously it was a different marketplace in the summer, you know, where this really started. You know, the Sabres talked back then to teams like the Minnesota Wild, for example, who made subsequent moves and weren't really in it as this season went along, you know, Anaheim, St. Louis, Carolina, we're all in there at various points, you know, Calgary, of course, right at the end was, was, you know, willing to, to give up a fair bit. I believe for Jack Eichel, I think, you know, the, the rumor that bounced around the night before it all went down on Wednesday was a little bit overly generous in terms of exactly what was on the table from the flames, but certainly Calgary was motivated here. And, and you know, what's interesting about Calgary, right. Just to quickly go down that thread is, is, yes. you know, they're having a great season, right? They're off to an amazing start uh, under Daryl Sutter, right up at the top of the Pacific division with Edmonton. Um, you know, those two teams, I mean, there's all kinds of angles here, but Vegas is probably taking a step back now this year. I'm not saying they'll miss the playoffs, but you know, they, they've got all these injuries. They're not going to have Jack Eichel for a long period of time here. Alex Tuck won't be coming back into their lineup when he gets healthy, which would have been an expectation. So there's an opportunity for those Canadian teams at the top of that division 
But, you know, I think Calgary is looking big picture at their team beyond this year. And there's, there's a lot of question marks, whether it's Johnny Gaudreau being in the final year of his contract. You got Andrew Mangiapane, who's really emerged as, as a real difference maker for that team. You know, he needs a new deal. Matthew Kachuk's still a restricted for agent coming up, but you, you're at the point with him. Are you signing him long term? Does he only want something short term? You know, what are you doing with him? And so, you know, I think that they saw an opportunity maybe to shake things up for the, the coming years beyond this one, you know, but they, they took a sw- swing and missed on this one, but, you know, kind of, kind of plant some seeds, I suppose, for what we might see from Brad tree living and the Calgary flames here, um, you know, in, in the next few months. And so, yeah, this, this, uh, this went in all different directions. There was a lot of information and misinformation and I am happy, as you know, Julian, I thought there was a, there was a set of circumstances here that this could have went on much, much, much longer than it did. And, and, you know, I'm just happy for, for those involved that they can move on and, and start to uh, start charting a way forward. Let's, let's talk about misinformation for a second and the Calgary flames, because uh, what was going around uh, the night before uh, Jack Eichel was traded, there was a report surfacing about uh, how Matthew Kachuk, I don't remember what else was rumored to be in said deal, but Matthew Kachuk of the Calgary Flames was rumored to be part of a package uh, for the Calgary Flames that would go to Buffalo in exchange for Jack Eichel. Uh, Kevin Adams, the GM, said that uh, the package that was around was not the case. He did not mention Matthew Kachuk by name, but that was the report that surfaced. So I think we could kind of make that judgment that it was him being mentioned. Um, what's, what's your take on it? It, it, it? Was that, was that ever a play at all? Was that ever real? Like, what are you, what are you thinking? Well, I think that there might've been a set of circumstances where Matthew Kachuk could have been part of a deal like this, but the other stuff that you're forgetting there, which doesn't make headlines because it's all draft picks and this and that, you know, it's undefined, you know, that's important. I mean, if, if they had have been trading Matthew Kachuk, uh, it's needless to say they weren't giving four other pieces in addition to that, which I believe is what the report was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so uh, look, I, fact and fiction here gets a little sketchy because once a trade isn't made, I mean, it doesn't benefit anyone that was in the middle of those conversations to be too honest about what was happening. But, you know, I, I don't think Calgary, how best to put this, they really wanted Jack Eichel if they could get him. And so, I think sure. that there's a scenario where they could have been compelled to include Matthew Kachuk in that deal, um, but that would have been the centerpiece of the of the trade. You know, you wouldn't be trading him plus two first rounders and and this and this and that. And you know, f- a, a big aspect of this for the Flames, had they made this deal, would have been you know shipping some salary back to Buffalo to make the numbers work. You know, as it turns out, because Vegas has so many injuries right now, they didn't have to do that, right? I mean, Alex Tuck carries a salary, but you know, the Sabres are bringing him on because he's, he's signed, you know, for a number of years in the future. They like the player. He's actually from upstate New York. It's a local guy. You're getting paid. Syracuse. There you are. The Cuse. Uh, you got, you got Peyton Krebs, who was a first rounder in 2019. And, and so, you know, he's an attractive piece for the Sabres, you know, Buffalo didn't have to retain salary in this and they didn't take on any salary. We might call bad salary or salary they didn't want. And, you know, that's, that's huge. There wasn't that many teams that could do that. And a lot of it actually comes due to the fact that that Mark Stone and Max Pacioretty are both injured right now for Vegas. So they're on LTIR. And, and what's interesting, you know, a final addendum to this trade, Julian, is, is Buffalo actually had to make a subsequent move where they got Johnny Boychuk's uh, contract from the New York Islanders just to reach the salary floor. Oh, uh, Because, you know, at this point in time, they had Jack Eichel counted on their roster. Uh, he wasn't on long-term injured reserve. And so losing his $10 million salary, they actually had to bring some salary on to make the books balance. And so a huge component of this trade, you know, was, was the cap machinations and, and, you know, what you had with, with Vegas uh, and and the Buffalo Sabres was an ability to make this work right now in this moment. You know, now Jack Eichel goes on LTIR. There's going to be some decisions for the Golden Knights down the road uh, when it comes time to activate them. But, you know, that's a few months hence from, from where we are today. And with Jack Eichel, as far as we know, the timetable for him to, to return is very much up in the air. It could be three months. It could be four months. It could even be five months. It, it, I think Kelly McCrimmon wasn't necessarily sure on, on the timeline on that. I'm not sure if you have any other insight on that. Well, you know, I, I would say this. That I saw some people out there thinking that this is all just some master my employee, you know, a la Kucherov to, to get him back for game one of the playoffs. You know, I really actually don't believe that. And I understand, look, it's, it's fun to have a tinfoil hat on and conspiracy theories and all that stuff. You know, I, I do believe that the Golden Knights, as soon as Jack Eichel's healthy enough and ready to play, will want to get him in the lineup. will want to accelerate that, that, you know, it's going to be a big moment in his career, Julian. He last played March 7th, 
2021, you know, it could conceivably yeah. be a full calendar year by the time he's healthy early March, you know, in 2022 now when he finally makes his Vegas debut. And so, you know, I don't think this is about skirting the cap or anything like that. It's really just, you know, he's having an artificial disc that isn't currently in his body put into his neck, you know, for lack of the medical ability to explain this. But I mean, this is a, a fairly significant procedure. Um, you know, it's one the Sabres didn't like for a number of reasons. You know, they wanted a fusion surgery. Uh, which would have seen some discs fused together, but you know you wouldn't be introducing something from outside the body to do it. Um, you know that the, the thinking there is that that actually limits your mobility, and there's an increased uh, chance you have to get another fusion in the future. Whereas if this ADR surgery, the artificial disc replacement, works as it's designed to, you know you you maintain more range of motion. It's it, it can be a shorter uh, time back, and you know you're less likely to need it again in the future. All that is a big mouthful to say. UFC fighters have got yes. this but no professional hockey players have ever got it. So you're not, you're not working off of this is the standard time frame, And, you know, I think the idea is he'll be skating relatively soon after getting it, assuming everything goes well, um, you know, but it, it could be months, I think, getting his conditioning back, you know, before he can take the necessary contact to be comfortable with, with, you know, that, that injury. I mean, this is a significant injury that, that this player suffered. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think there's any games going on here. I don't expect to see him at the Olympics. I know there's speculation about that. I mean, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe absolute best case scenario, maybe he heals quicker than you could ever imagine. Maybe, and I mean, really long shot that USA hockey by early January can have an idea that this guy could maybe play for them because they have to name him to the team, of course, before the February tournament. But I think more realistic, we're looking at Jack Eichel playing games in March. Uh, is there anything else on the Jack Eichel dossier that you'd like to mention before we move on? By the way, for everyone listening, uh, this is not the last time we'll discuss trade talks on this show. And if you happen to live in Toronto, you may be very well interested in what CJ might have to say. But on the topic of Jack Eichel, is there anything else you want to add before we move on? Uh, no, not really. Other than, you know, I, I tip my hat to Vegas. You know, <laughs> I think that one thing... You know, one thing worth mentioning with the Golden Knights, they've now they've made six ever first round draft picks and four of them have now been traded with Peyton Krebs. And, you know, in exchange for those picks, they've gotten Mark Stone. Uh, they've gotten Max Pacioretty. They got Nolan Patrick uh, in the summer. Now they've added Eichel. Uh, you know, they signed Petrangelo as, a, as an unrestricted free agent, the biggest name on the market a couple of years ago. I mean, this to me, like this is like Kelly McCrimmon and before him, George McPhee. It's like they're GMing a video game or something, you know, they're, they're one season doesn't go quite as you like, you go get the superstar. And, and, you know, I think that's exciting. I think, I think it's really smart. I think this is a worthy gamble on Eichel um, because look, the hardest thing in this league to get is elite game breaking difference, making talent. And, you know, even Vegas might arguably not have that. I think Mark Stone is probably in that, that realm. Um, but to get someone else who can do that, even if there is a bit of risk there, even if you've got a, now wait through the surgery it might honestly even mean this could be the first ever year. The Golden Knights do miss the playoffs. I mean, based on how injured they are right now, and, and we're not talking short-term injuries, you know, William Carlson's just gone down with a broken foot. He's four to six weeks. You've got Pacioretty and stone out. Nolan Patrick is out. I mean, they're, they're missing this, you know, half of their forward group is sort of AHL or so fringe, a lot of pieces fringe players. You know, it's, it's, it's just, look, it's been bad timing. And so, you know, I like even that they're potentially even willing to weaken their very short-term hopes here. They're not going all in to try to be great this year, but you know, that you're buying four seasons beyond this one of Jack Eichel and his prime. And so, you know, I, I think that that organization has been great for the sport on a number of levels, but uh, you know, just they're, they're out there trying to win and, and let's hope more teams copy them. Cause I think we could get some more interesting trades in the future if, if they do. We'll, we'll have to see about that. We transition from transition from Jack Eichel uh, to two of your latest stories in the Toronto Star, and they have to do with two players in particular, uh, Wayne Simmons and, and Robin Leonard, who have both used their platforms uh, to speak out about the NHLPA and its role in the handling of Kyle Beach, who, as we all know, was previously known as John Doe in the sexual abuse allegations directed towards the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, how refreshing is it? Uh, seeing guys like Robin Leonard and, and Wayne Simmons. And I know Brandon Gallagher has also spoke about this as well, but I know you wrote about Leonard and Simmons. Uh, what's it been like just kind of seeing those two players uh, talk about the NHL PA and, and their handling and all of this? Well, you know, I'll start with Leonard because, you know, obviously we, we've talked about him. I know previously when he sent the, the tweets out in early October, Julian, 
And, you know, I think everyone's familiar now because he has been so open with his own journey with mental health and addiction in the past. But, you know, it occurred to me this week, really, what an island that he's on in a lot of ways in this league. And I'll set the scene for you. You know, the, the Golden Knights were here in Toronto. They practiced on Monday at Scotiabank Arena. There was a handful of reporters there, myself, Mark Masters from, from TSN as well, Mike Zeisberger from NHL.com. And, you know, we would requested Leonard. And I, I'm not sure, you know, where it broke down, but I don't get the feeling he didn't necessarily want to talk to us. I don't think it got to him or maybe it was just said not today. So then, you know, it comes back to Tuesday. They're, they're playing the Maple Leafs that night. You know, obviously we still want to talk to him. We come in the morning skate, you know, no Robin Leonard presented to us, you know, and then they play this a game where they are down all these players. We're talking about, they lose four, nothing, a really difficult game for a goaltender. Certainly those goals aren't on Robin Leonard. It was more, his team just couldn't get out of its own end. And then he's still got to come to the podium and take those kind of questions. And Sheesh. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying not everyone would do that in his shoes. And, and he took two or three or four questions on the game. And then he spent eight minutes and or nine minutes talking about the Kyle beach situation, you know, about his own interactions with Kyle beach, some of his thoughts about the NHLPA, some of his just broader thoughts, you know, he really called out his fellow players and, and not in a, not in a harsh manner, but he just, he just said, look, it's up to us to leave this league better for the next group to come. Uh, you know, we want to have kids, you know, I'm using his words that, that play in this league and you want them to be coming into something better than what's here. And he also said, I don't blame the stars. He said, you know, from what I've seen, the stars don't even see the problems because they're treated so differently um, that they might not even realize all the things that, that need changed here. And, you know, afterwards I had a brief exchange with Robin in the hallway. I just thanked them for doing that. And, you know, I'll, I'll keep most of what he said private, but like, I got the feeling that it's, it can be a bit of a burden for him. Right. Like he, you know, he wants to just be another player in a lot of ways. He wants to be someone focused on winning the Stanley cup, like everyone else in the league. But he also understands that if he, passes up a chance like that in a place like Toronto uh, where there's a lot of microphones and people interested in his thoughts that, that it's a missed opportunity for, for players everywhere. And so, you know, just, just sort of watching that few days play out, it really, you know, I think my respect for him increased even a little bit more and that's not because I didn't respect him. It's just, you know, I I think that because there are not a lot of players in the league willing to to take that on um, Robin's got to carry more of the burden. And, And honestly, I think it hurts him. Like, I don't know what he got out of it, I guess, is what I'm saying. I can't imagine his mm-hmm. team is all that thrilled that he's out there doing that. And I'm not saying they're trying to muzzle him or anything, but, you know, I think they'd rather him not, after that kind of loss, have to do that. But he feels a responsibility for it. And, and you know, it kind of brings us to Wayne Simmons because it was the next day after that on Wednesday at Leafs practice where Wayne, you know, really started addressing some of these issues. And he mentioned he had heard what Robin Leonard said the night before, and he felt, you know, that was even – kind of gave him even more of a push to – to be honest with the media, because let's face it, I think a lot of guys have views on all these issues, you know, privately, they're talking to each other about them. Like I get that, but sometimes saying it in front of the microphone, saying it where people like you and I, Julian can, can, can put those quotes out or or run the clips on television, what have you. Like, I think that there's some power to that, you know, much like there was a difference between, uh, you know, the 107 page report from Jenner and block about what happened in in Chicago. And that was awful to read. Like, I'm not saying that wasn't impactful, But it was much more impactful to see Kyle Beach, you know, have the interview we did the next day with Rick Weston and and put a human face to it and, and, you know, speak with real emotion. And so, you know, I I think we're we're at an interesting spot with this league where I don't expect that we're now going to have 50 guys around the league, you know, trying to get that message out. But, you know, if nothing else, we had one and Wayne Simmons who stepped up after hearing what Robin Leonard had to say. And, you know, I hope that there are more that if they have views on what happened here, if they understand the gravity of this and, and, and really embrace their, their platforms. I mean, you know, I, I could see that as something positive to come out of this. And so I know we're doing stick taps later, but I'll give my, my stick tap to Robin because, you know, it, it's, it's not easy being out there on that Island all the time. And, and, you know, I think he really is doing it for the right reasons. Never too early to uh, bring up stick taps. And I, I hope that more and more players say something. Uh, I can understand that just going out there on your own could be very intimidating. But when you think about what happened to Kyle Beach and everything that happened and everything you had to hide for the last 11 years, it's essentially a culture of silence that basically allowed that to fester and let it get to where it was. So if people like Robin Leonard and Wayne Simmons and other players around the National Hockey League use their platforms and say something, we can call attention to what's going on and maybe we 
maybe it does something in preventing another Kyle Beach situation from happening. So good on right. those two guys for saying something. And Wayne's been in the league for 14 years. You know, like Wayne Simmons has played a lot of NHL games. He's seen a lot. He's played for different organizations. You know, one point he made was that in his experience, when something bad happens in hockey, everyone's afraid to speak to it, he says, because, you know, there, there's some fear of repercussions there, fear mm-hmm. of, of stepping outside maybe the mold of, of what's expected of you. And, you know, that's what Wayne was kind of hitting at in, in, in the theme of his answers to the media was just, uh, we got to break that mold. We got to, you know, recognize that that's not the way to be. And, you know, I think, you know, I actually, actually have always found Wayne to be very thoughtful on a lot of topics. And, and so this is, this wasn't fully brand new for him that he came out and addressed the Kyle Beach stuff, but I thought he did it in a very eloquent way. You, you could see the emotion on him, frankly. He mentioned, you know, that he teared up watching the interview originally that he saw with Rick Westhead and Kyle Beach. And, you know, I thought spoke pretty passionately, you know, he acknowledged he's, his faith in the NHLPA has been shaken uh, by, by, you know, what's, what's happened or not happened in the case of supporting Kyle Beach. And, you know, I, I think it's a great spot for someone like him to do it. And, and, you know, I guess what I'm getting at here is I get, if you're in the second year in the league, maybe you don't want to be coming out, you know, speaking with that kind of force and maybe you're just not capable of it, but, you know, I think more guys in, in Wayne's shoes and Robin's shoes have been around, who have seen a lot of different things, you know, they, they can help make the, the culture better and uh, for the guys coming behind them. And I think that that's ultimately what's motivating them. I mean, it's supporting Kyle Beach in this case. And then it's, it's trying to, to make sure that, you know, some of the systemic issues in the sport aren't allowed to perpetuate themselves to, to create the circumstances where anything as grotesque as this could happen again. Uh, last question on this, uh, unless there's other stuff you want to add, but I wanted to know what your thoughts on Wayne Simmons' idea that, you know, having a neutral party uh, decide future NHL incidents, uh, certainly of the magnitude that we're dealing with right now, might be better as opposed to letting teams in the league ultimately decide the fates of of people who are involved in these particular incidents. Is that a good idea? What do you think? Well, it's a fantastic idea. It's It's almost an obvious solution to a systemic problem. But I don't know how likely it is. You know what I mean? And, and ultimately, the NHL is a business and these teams are corporations within the larger business. And, you know, I think that they like to have control over these things. But let's face it, they're all they're, the No one is looking at this. I'm not saying that anyone wants to do the wrong thing. It's not at all what I'm sort of suggesting. But, you know, they're all conflicted. <laughs> like everyone knows each other. You're, you're looking for a reason to look out for your friend, say, or, or business associate, perhaps when you're coming down with discipline rather than, you know, where a third party just might look at this more clearly. And, and you know, I, it's not to say that there would ever be unanimous support or uh, for any decision made. I mean, I think a lot of these decisions are difficult and, and people will argue about whether this was right or this was wrong. But, you know, you at least you at least remove the potential biases built in uh, or conflicts of interest if, if you do that. And so. You know, as much as I'd love to see that installed next week, you know, I'm not thinking that's going to happen, but, you know, good on Wayne for putting it out there and hopefully more people talk about it because I do think, you know, it is a way to, you know, for anyone who's maybe lost faith in the process here, lost faith in the league, you know, wonders about the underlying motivations that aren't being spoken about, what better to remove it than to have this taken out of the hands of the people that, that have some of those conflicts. And so, yeah, it makes a ton of sense. I can't poke one hole in it. I just don't know if the people in power right now are ever going to allow that to happen. Check out uh, CJ's work on in the Toronto Star uh, on Wayne Simmons and as well on Robin Leonard. Uh, I, I did say that was going to be my last question on this, but I guess since we're talking about the NHLPA, anything out there about Donald Fear, anything about those player meetings, anything else we should know about, or are we still just kind of waiting right now? Yeah, a little bit of stuff. I mean, look, I think that there is, there's certainly some divide among players and th- thoughts here. You know, I don't think Donald Fear's job by any stretch is completely safe. But, you know, now they're going through this independent investigation, which he suggested the executive board. My yes. understanding is that's going to take three months, give or take, to complete. So, you know, there's going to be a period of time now where, you know, I'm not sure we're going to hear too much or there won't be necessarily much more clarity on what's happening. Um you know, but that investigation, depending on what it shows, I think could have some repercussions for both Don Fear, maybe other senior leadership at the NHLPA, just in terms of identifying how did this fall through the cracks? I mean, something went wrong here. And, you know, I can't pretend to have all the answers or know what it was. But I mean, I think it is worthy to 
at least try to identify what that was because maybe there is some actions that can be taken, even just in changing the way processes work. Not not necessarily just you know bombing four people out of their jobs, but but you know changing the machinations of of the way the union functions. You know, I think that that is valuable. You know, and and in the meantime, I do know as well, Julian, that Don Fear will continue kind of working day to day. It's business as usual. Even while this investigation happens, he's going to go on his fall tour of the, the the all the teams in the league, which he does every year at the start of the season. Still be addressing players, and so you know, even though this is going on in the background, you know, he's still on the job, you know, the same way Stan Bowman was quite frankly, when the investigation was going on for Jenner and block, same way Joe Quenville was, you know, no one's asking him to step aside uh, while that process plays out. Hi everyone. I'm Julian McKenzie and I'm here to talk about Manscaped. I had an idea to show you a whole bunch of these Manscaped products, but Jesse told me that if I started showing them, this might end up being an X-rated ad. So just to be safe, I'm just going to read the copy that's been presented in front of me. Thanks, Jesse. Guess what, fellas? The boys are buzzing because hockey is back. Want to know what else is buzzing? The Lawnmower 4.0 from our friends at Manscaped. They are the global leaders in male grooming, trusted by over 2 million men worldwide. Wow. Don't get chirped this year for having a Jumbo Joe Bush below the waist. Join the Manscaped movement for all of your hairy grooming needs and get 20% off free shipping with the code CHRIS21 at manscaped.com. Mind you, this ad was as PG as possible, and I still had to read the phrase, Jumbo Joe, Bush Below the Waist. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for keeping us on the straight and narrow. And be sure to buy Manscaped products, because they're good. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. If you want a 10% discount on uh, the next session you ever want to do from BetterHelp, uh, go to betterhelp.com slash Johnston for that 10% discount. If you haven't heard about it, they are a customized online therapy service that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so that you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Why invest in everything else and not your mind? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Chris Johnston Show fans. You can get yourself 10%. I know I said it off your next session. It's actually off the first month that you use betterhelp.com. So go to betterhelp.com slash Johnston for a 10% discount off the first month that you use their service. It's fall, which means football. It's football time. It's in full swing. Gotta love football. And for many of us, there's no way to better enjoy these games than by having some skin in the game. And that's why BetMGM remains the exclusive betting partner of The Athletic. And as a fan of The Athletic, you can bet $10 to win $150, plus a free three-month subscription or extension to your subscription with The Athletic. When you bet with BetMGM using our promo code, just sign up at BetMGM.com and use the promo code The Athletic Pod. that's all in one word, at checkout to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sportsbooks. The King of Sportsbooks is a pretty good title. That's about $10 to an $150 plus three months free from The Athletic at betmgm.com using the promo code THEATHLETICPOD. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. Arizona, Colorado, Washington, D.C., Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP in Arizona, 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Washington, D.C., Nevada, Wyoming, and Virginia, 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-GAMBLER in Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Call or text the Tennessee red line 800-889-9789 in Tennessee or call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Okay, so we go from Jack Eichel to the comments made by Robin Leonard and Wayne Simmons to another transition to uh, not stick taps just yet, but uh, I came up with an idea because uh, while we were talking about what we wanted to talk about on today's episode, you listed off a whole bunch of different topics. Funny enough, we, we casually just said, hey, we should probably mention what's up with Jack Eichel. And then everything kind of blew up and it turned into its own thing. Uh, so in the, in the style of, of insider trading, I almost said Saturday headlines, but you don't do that anymore. Uh, we're going to talk retired altogether now. So it's not yeah. called that. It, you know, it, That's true. It, could, it couldn't continue on without me, I guess. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. I love Fridge. It could, it could continue out that way. They just rebranded when I left. I, I love Fridge too. Uh, yeah, and and Jeff Merrick and, and everyone else. I mean, I've never met them, uh, but yay, they seem like pretty nice guys. Anyway. Oh, they're awesome guys, and I'm pumped for Jeff. I mean, he deserves to to get more spotlight. And when I saw him there on week one, I sent him some nice notes. He's you know super guy and been around for a long time, and he's earned his reputation too. Absolutely. So to the segment I was going to come up with, a grab bag. Uh, And instead of just being like, you know what, let me just throw out the topics and see which one he bites on. I actually found myself an actual bag and I put some of the topics in the bag. for people. Is there Halloween candy in there too or what? It looks like something you might have left over from the other other week. Um, There's some kind of wrapping paper here. So right. no, there's no candy in here, but there are topics in here and there's about a, a handful of them. So are you uh, pulling them out at random and literally we're just going to go with them? That's literally what I'm going to do. We're going to pull them out at random and uh, we'll see how this uh, particular uh, segment goes. Maybe we do this again this is, the next time. You have this a is more of a visual on. thing for those listening just on a podcaster. You're like, what's going on? There's a rustling, well, there's a bag. But that's the thing, right? Like it's a listening thing. So well, for the listeners, Roughly, <laughs> some ASMR going on over here. I don't know. I'm just trying to make it as immersive as I can. Okay, uh, I pulled out the first topic here. Um, I kind of wrote these just as questions that I think I would ask, and you could kind of leap into you know b- b- revealing what information you want to reveal. Should the Toronto Maple Leafs make a trade? Are they in on anything or anyone? Well, they're definitely in on stuff uh, because it's been pretty. It's been pretty loud the last 24, 36 hours, I'd say. Um, you know, and it sounds like the Leafs are more in the selling mode maybe than the buying, at oh. least in this in this point in time. And, you know, essentially they're they're looking to move one of their defensemen. And, you know, the two names that, you know, that, that other teams are saying are out there are, are that of Travis Dermott and Justin Hall, both of whom play on the right side of the Leafs blue line. Uh, Hall's a right shot. Dermott's a left who plays the right side. Mm-hmm. And I think really this is, it comes from the fact that a this might be a way to free up a little bit of cal- salary cap room, uh, which is useful for a team like the Leafs because they're having trouble maneuvering. That's how they ended up with a NCAA goaltender on their bench for as a backup in one game already this year. That they, they don't have a lot of space to to, to bobble around. But they they also feel as though Timothy Lilligren and Rasmus Sandin are both top six defensemen this season. And you know, for most of last year, those guys weren't in the Leafs' top six, and so the fact that they've sort of grabbed onto roles there. And I think the Leafs really want them to play. They're, they're young. They're, they're still in their entry-level deals. You know, not one of those veterans wouldn't want to be sitting for them. And lately it has been Justin Hall. And so, you know, I, I get the sense something could happen quite quickly here. He had uh, what might be a false alarm, but maybe two hours ago, my phone was blowing up for oh. a while, thinking something was cooking that, that imminently. So maybe by the time this comes out, we'll see. But uh, it does seem as though Toronto's trying to move – one of their depth defensemen, I think they'll be able to, you know, I would think if this happened, it would be short term, try to get by me because it does leave them a little shy on depth if they run into injuries at some point, but it might help them accrue some cap space as they get closer to the trade deadline, maybe to trade for a defenseman, you know, to go on, on a playoff run at some point. So, you know, I think this might be shifting around the deck chairs, trying to do right by the players themselves because they have seven guys that should be playing and only six spots on any given night. And um, yeah, I do think that that something could happen there sooner than later. Okay, back to the bag. Uh, one thing I'm also going to do, it's more of a rule for myself because I am prone to asking a lot of follow-up questions with you. I'm going to try to limit the follow-up questions uh, at most just one. I'm not, I don't feel it to ask one for the Leafs, but uh, we'll see about all the other topics. Uh, this one's a big one here. Um, let's see. Uh, what are your thoughts on... Uh, Brad Aldridge's name being removed from the Stanley Cup in light of the uh, findings from the Jenner and Block report. Uh, and uh, we all know that happened. Is there any other update on that story that we should know? So believe it or not, there's some divided opinion out there. And really? you know, I, I don't think anyone wants to see Brad Aldridge's name on the cup at all. But, you know, there is some thought from those kind of involved that when you actually see the picture with the X's, basically almost in the middle of that 9 10 Blackhawks plate that it, it might in a strange way, almost be like a piece of notoriety. It might become something. If you happen to be around the cup, you want to see just to see it because you know, it's, it's been in the news, you're aware of it. And that in it, 
strange about, you know, strange way it's, it might be drawing attention to what's happened here. And I think the whole idea is trying to remove someone's association with that team. And so I do know there are people pretty close to the middle of this thing that wouldn't mind seeing the whole ring basically be, you know, re-engraved just without Brad Aldrich's name mentioned at all. I don't know if that's going to happen. I think that's, it's not an easy thing. It doesn't happen in a day and it's no. certainly not cheap because uh, we're talking about actual silver and, you know, there's, it's, it's quite a, I think it takes like a week to do something like that. So, you know, and that would be someone's time. Yeah. Um, but so I, I'm a little bit split on it. I certainly understand why people don't want his name on the cup, but by putting 10 X's in the middle of that plate, I, in a weird, strange way, it's almost like X marks the spot. Like this is the, this is the thing where that guy did that thing. And so um, it'll be interesting to see if that last as is. Uh, but I think, that, I think everyone's sort of mind was in the right place with that, trying to remove association from him, but you know, it kind of a you know, bit of a strange turn of events there. And just as a sort of more of a quirky note than anything. So Thursday, you know, today we're recording this, Julian was the first day that cup has been back on display in public since it was engraved with the most recent lightning championship and those X's and where is it, but just by chance in suburban Chicago at a massive youth hockey tournament, it was pre-scheduled, nothing related to this, but the first place the Stanley cup appears in public after this happens is like literally half an hour, an hour from Chicago in in this hot youth hockey tournament. So what a strange set of circumstances. Absolutely. Um, Let's go to another one that's in here. I'll, I'll do a better job with this whole bag thing. I'll be real with you. Um, I don't know. I like it. You're you're bringing new segments to the the, the table here. If well, we waited for me to organize this thing, we'd never be organized. Yeah, that's true. Um, I realized one of the topics that was in the bag had to do with uh, Kyle Beach and Donald Fear. So we can kind of scrap that because we've kind of already touched off on that. So we yep. technically only have one last topic left uh, to bring up from the grab bag, which, uh, hey, you know, oh, maybe you know what with the bag, I might even mark it grab bag instead of just having it being a random uh brown we should buy bag. we should buy some of the stickers from the new merch that are out we could throw yeah. your face on that grab bag maybe my face in that grab bag and you know we could we could decorate by the way uh that's a very nice promo uh for the fact that we have merch for the cj show which you can go through on the sdpn website as the sdpn.ca or hey why not download the sdpn app on your phone. Sorry. SDPN app. I don't know why I can't pronounce words. I'm actually today. worried that we're going to sell out of the merch. That my dad is just going to put all his money into <laughs> our merch. Like I was scared to share that with him because I'm like, oh no, like he's going to order one of everything. Oh, come on. Come on. I, you don't want to see your dad wearing a, a sweater with your face on it with Coburg on it? I love him dearly, but no, I don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too weird. I, have you shown your dad the uh, the gif of you with uh, your head on Drake uh, going through Toronto? The, Not on the purpose. Started from the bottom video. <laughs> Not on purpose, but he follows pretty closely online. So I'm guessing he's seen that uh, just with you you sending out there, Julian. Shout out Papa Johnston. Uh, loving his son's content. All right. Here's his, the his last grandkids topic all call him Coburg Papa. So there you go. Ooh. Oh, he should be Coburg Poppy, actually. Coburg Poppy. He would really dig that. Um, give me some Team Canada Olympic dark horse candidates. All right. This one I can do. Um, you know, I, I think it's only interesting to mention guys that aren't obvious here, right? Like we're sure. not going to talk about Nathan McKinnon potentially making Team Canada because we all understand, assuming he's healthy, he's on the team, even though he hasn't been named yet. Um, right. But, you know, it does seem there's a couple different sort of battles brewing, if you want to call it. And I think... You know, one of them, they're trying to zone, hone in on the left side of the blue line. And I suspect there's only room, most likely, because nothing's, you know, it's still a little couple months away. So things could happen. But, um, you know, Darnell Nurse, Josh Morrissey, and Morgan Riley. My guess is one of those players mm. most likely makes his team. I don't think more than one of them make the team. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting that, that that is something that, you know, I think they're tracking right now early in the season, you know, another guy, and I mentioned him earlier in the episode, Julian is, is Andrew Mangiapane. And, you know, he's a fascinating story because I'm comfortable saying in no world would he have been on the long list had he not gone to the world championship last year. So he happens to go to the world championship last year. And, you know, he, he shows up a couple of days late because the flame season went long. 
you know, he, he leads the tournament in scoring. He's the MVP. Canada wins an extremely unlikely gold medal in Latvia with, oh, a, team, yeah. with a team, you know, it wasn't an all-star team with respect. Everyone went over and played and they had a bad the, start to the tournament too. Remember? Right. Wore the, wore the colors with pride. And so Andrew Maggiapani gets himself on hockey Canada's radar with that performance. And then he starts this season with seven goals in eight games. And, you know, he wouldn't be coming on this team to be a goal scorer, but, you know, I think the one thing we have to remember when they're making decisions on like the 12th, 13th, 14th forward, you know, they're looking for players that can play multiple positions, maybe kill penalties. That's something Manji Pani does. And I think that, you know, they're looking for a degree of, of being able to be used in different ways because, you know, I think the scoring part of the lineup is taken care of, if you know what I mean. Uh, mm-hmm. And, but, you know, as they, they kind of make the final decisions, you know, that's something to look at. Another name in that vein that probably isn't getting a lot of attention so far is Anthony Sorelli. And, you know, I do know the lightning feel that, that he's, you know, probably been their best forward earlier, early in this season, you know, he's coming off those two cup wins, doesn't get a ton of hype or I haven't seen him on anyone's list, but, you know, for the same reasons, maybe as Manji Pani, that he can kill penalties, you know, could, could play some center or wing, depending on what you need, you know, likely a winger on that, that kind of team, you know, he's another name to watch and look, he's got, you know, John Cooper's his head coach in Tampa. He's the head coach with team Canada. You know, there's a huge group of, people making the decision on the, on the final roster, but you know, he's another sort of dark horse name I'm, I'm watching. And I do think is maybe more on the radar than the average person, you know, and a final one actually that, you know, I don't know how much is out there, but, but Zach Hyman, um, yeah. you know, he's, he's on the long list, uh, which, which might surprise some. And, you know, he's playing with Connor McDavid right now. Everyone in Edmonton's that, that plays big minutes or they're all getting tons of cookies. He's, you know, Zach scored a lot early in the season, I think maybe some Chris Kunitz like vibes from 2014, you know, Kunitz played with Sidney Crosby in Pittsburgh and and made team Canada. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not sure yet how likely it is he makes a team, but, but he's certainly on the radar and and being watched. And, you know, the fact that he's meshing well with Connor McDavid is certainly going to help his case. Absolutely. And with that, that concludes the first ever edition of the grab bag. Uh, Yay. Nay. Lukewarm. How are we feeling about that? I like the grab bag because it's a way maybe to hit on a bunch of random stuff quickly. And and we all know the big boss man, Adam Wilde, wants us to be quick. So, yes, of course, uh, we don't have to do it like on a particular day. We could just if you ever have any like little tidbits you want to throw around there, just let me know. We'll pull out the grab bag. And if it gets to a point where it has to be a weekly thing, we'll make it so. But, yeah, we'll 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 think about bringing back the grab bag. I, I, I liked it. So I'm glad that you like it. Um, let's go to our final segment, uh, which happens every Thursday. Stick taps, uh, where we just show some love, we show some praise to somebody uh, in the hockey community or pay hey, wherever we really want to. At the end of the day, it's our show. We can do whatever we want to a point. Uh, but uh, CJ, do you have a stick tap or do you want me to start? Well, I'll leave the floor to you because I've already tapped my stick a yes. few times for Robin Leonard and I'm going to stick with, with Robin. I won't throw too many names out there, but I think he deserves it. Thank you for speaking to the reporters in Toronto this week. More importantly, thank you for everything you, you do in championing uh, maybe some of the unheard voices around the sport and, you know, it, uh, it's, it's not going unnoticed, Robin. So keep it up, bud. Absolutely. Um, I will give out two sets of stick taps, uh, one to a, uh, women's hockey star, Blake Bolden, who I had the opportunity to speak to last week for a story that's out now in the athletic about a six month, uh, virtual mentorship program for aspiring female hockey players. I think it's a really cool story. Uh, she has had some sort of this mentorship program before, uh, but she was able to get uh, the Winmark company, which uh, owns a uh, played against sports franchise. Uh, she got those partners involved to sponsor it. So it's a free mentorship program. Uh, I think the first Saturday of every month, about 25 girls between the ages of like, I think 13 and 16 participate. And they learn from Blake and they learn from other uh, special guests that are involved. And uh, it seems like a really cool thing to do. Uh, one thing I, I think about with that story, uh, it did kind of come out after uh, the fallout of the Kyle Beach week that uh, we all parsed through. And I thought people would have just been like blase about it or whatever. But I saw in the comments that a lot of people were actually happy about the story. And it was some, one person in particular said that, you know what, it's good to see that there's actually is some good in, in hockey because we have dumped on it a lot in the last few days. But there are good people working at making the sport approachable and accessible and, and, and good for, for people who enjoy it. So uh, I want to give a stick tap to Blake Bolden, uh, who also uh, happens to uh, not only was she the first 
I think first first African American first round pick in the CWHL. Uh, she is now a scout for the Los Angeles Kings, and she now works with uh, ESPN and contributes to them. I think she's the first fee- black female scout uh, to work in the NHL. I'll have to double check that. And I'm sorry, I don't have that specifically, but Blake Bolden is very much a trailblazer in every sense of the world and in, in everything that she's done so far. Awesome. To this, yes. To Nothing the but second respect for Blake, and you did a great job on that story, bud. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the retweet. The second stick tap I want to give is to Avery Lewis McDougal, uh, my good friend who I do a show with uh, on Zone Time with Yahoo Sports. Uh, the other night, unfortunately for him, he uh, was at an Oilers game and he was subjected to a bunch of racial taunts from a fan. Uh, I saw him tweet about it. A lot of people have reached out to him in support. And not just uh, individuals like myself on Twitter, uh, the Edmonton Oilers themselves uh, also tweeted at Avery that uh, they were sorry. And uh, I, I give taps to the Oilers and I give taps to Avery, who I just think is a really good friend. We haven't met in person, but we talk, we've talked a lot over the last few months. Uh, I get to enjoy doing a show with him every now and again when he's on. And he's a really good dude. And he's part of the next generation of hockey and sports media people in this country that we desperately need. It's not just going to be a, a, a TV channel or just going to be just old, boring white guys just talking about a sport. We need uh, people like dinosaur. Avery. I don't. Hey, look, man, uh, you're at least one of those people who are, you know, generally nice with your time and and very helpful. Uh, but Avery is part of that change. I think I'm part of that change too, and a whole bunch of other younger people as well. Uh, we need more people like Avery Lewis McDougal out there in the uh, in the hockey world and in the sports world. So I'm giving you some stick taps, buddy. Yeah, me too. I'm seconding that one. Avery's a great guy. I've met him a number of times at puck talks events over the years. I bumped into him on the road to, to in Edmonton when I've been out there. So. Sorry you had that happen, pal, but uh, you got a lot of people in your corner. Absolutely. And that's going to do it for this week's edition of uh, all the episodes we had of the CJ Show. It's weird to say this week's edition when we do a show two times a week. Uh, We'll be back on Monday. Ask CJ, of course, we'll be back. Will there be any other big stories we got to talk about? We'll be here for that, I'm sure, because... That's what the show is for. Subscribe to the YouTube page for the SDPN. Uh, We are climbing and climbing in subscribers. Subscribe to all the podcasts. So subscribe to our podcast, wherever you get podcasts. Uh, Subscribe to uh, Agent Provocateur with with Alan Walsh. Uh, Subscribe to the Steve Dangle podcast as well. And subscribe to the Game Over podcast. And I believe there's more coming. I, I have no clue what's coming next month. I have no clue what's coming in the spring. I have no clue what's coming after that. It just feels as if there's going to be more podcasts coming. And we're just here for all the announcements, I guess. Sources say that the SDPN isn't stopping right here, bud. We got nah. uh, we got a lot more coming up for you. Nah, 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 nah. The, the, the SDPN is a train uh, that is not going to stop. So, uh for uh, Chris Johnston, a.k.a. Big Money CJ, a.k.a. The Drake of Coburg, a.k.a. Reporter Chris, a.k.a. The Bitcoin Brother, a.k.a. Condo Chris, a.k.a. The Don of Division Street, I'm Julian Singh. So long, and uh, we'll talk to you all on Monday. Peace. Peace, bro. Let's go. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter, at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie, at JK McKenzie. 